Continuing here. Yeah, so I was saying that the Federal Reserve, okay, shouldn't exist the day after the assassination of JFK. Okay, that's it, man. I mean, this is absurd. Our four parents would would be rolling around in their grave. Oh, my God, they, they'd be apoplectic. They, they, they'd be taking whips and, and beating us all. Okay, this is absurd. Not to mention what God would do and, and Jesus would do, calling ourselves a Christian nation. We lost it, man. We lost the country in 1963. The money printers took over. It's that clear. It's as clear as a light of day. And this is what's affecting your local communities. These people debasing our currency, okay, through anti-capitalism. Do you understand? They're debasing our currency by artificially raising our cost of living tax. This is what's been going on. And you could. it would have been easy to prevent just every year if they had just given minimum wage adjustments and say, hey, you're going to play games like that? we got market manipulators out there that are colluding together, these special interest groups that collude together to fix prices, rig prices. This is what's going on. It's anti-progress. That's called regression. That's always my whole life. Okay, the last time America had hope was 1963 when a Democratic president. So anybody that thinks that I'm, <laughs> you know, anti-democratic, oh, no. Oh, no. And I still, to this day, I'm not sure what Martin Luther King Jr. was, but these are two men of my generation that I have the utmost regard for. And I'm very lucky that my dad and I did, too, because he kind of went off the, uh, you know, the, the left liberal kind of uh, deep end, I'd say. But uh, I, I'm not sure. I mean, he, you know, he accepted me with my beliefs, and he knew that I was really kind of conservative in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, I'm not at all convinced that this established system is on the right track. And, uh, you know, he kind of believed it later in his life, particularly working within the establishment. But uh, he was very anti-establishment at one time. Back in the 60s, during the Vietnam War, he was very pissed off about the assassination of JFK. So we're looking at 1965, and he wrote a book called Apple Pie, Satire of the United States Government. Sold millions of copies. He went on a TV talk show. Um, and it was a mysteriously yanked. I had never read the book as a kid. It was a, Apparently there was a lot of vulgarities. And he later in life said he wasn't particularly proud about it. And, you know, he talked about J. Edgar Hoover and his cross-dressing when that was kind of like uh, uh, taboo. I, I don't think that anybody that knew about that, what was going on, you weren't supposed to repeat it. It might have been what got it yanked off the shelves, but uh, it disappeared. And um, But anyhow, uh, he was uh, very opposed to that war, even though he never grew his hair long and became, you know, anything a classical stereotype hippie, so to speak. But he was very, very upset about the Vietnam War. He did not feel like that was a just cause. And, uh, you know, we had one of these stickers on our car that were so popular back in the 60s, you could probably find images of them, that war is not healthy for children and other living things, little black and yellow stickers, I remember, if I remember correctly. But, you know, and this is a guy that was a Marine. He did his four-year stint, came out of, you know, I guess he had some issues. He did punch one of his drill sergeants once he... He's kind of a badass. He learned not to be a pushover uh, from a very early age um, when his mother died at eight. And he had to go out and deliver newspapers and milk in the snow. It was during the Depression. He was born in 1928, to give you an idea of the time frame. So 1936 and to when he joined the Merchant Marine, he went from there into the Marine Corps. But So we're talking about... Uh, I guess he lost his mother in 36. I guess things were pretty rough in America at that time. He lived in uh, Revere, Massachusetts. Either he was born in Revere and lived in Shirley or born in Shirley and lived in, I can't remember. but So in Massachusetts and uh, harsh winters, uh, that's where my uh, lineage comes from, south of um, Toronto, Canada, above Niagara Falls. And there's a port credit. If you look it up, you'll see where my dad's dad came from, who was purportedly pretty much... Indian, my dad's dad. So, and his mother was Irish. So, the Indian Joseph Daniel, my dad's dad, married um, an Irish immigrant woman. 
but uh yeah so it's fun to you know look back at your roots but that's where the name comes from credit port credit but he had it rough. So the era was 36 to when he was 8 to when he was 16. So that 8 year, 40 till 1942, when he joined the Merchant Marine. And 44, I guess he went in the Marine Corps and to 48. And somewhere in that uh, later, 48, when he got out of uh, the Marine Corps, he was kicking around. He did one job after another. He said he worked for an ambulance company. He could not hang with that. It was too, too gory for him. It's pretty tough. you got to be a special constitution to do that kind of work. But he did a lot of different stuff, and um, he met my mom in Los Angeles, where she lived. They, both her parents were Dalmatian immigrants. I don't know how I digressed in this whole family history, but, um, you know, just to give you an idea of who my dad was, and um, he was radical. He really was. So that book was considered very radical back in the 60s. And you know how radical things were. I mean, but, you know, we heard of the Kent State shootings. and I mean, it was pretty authoritarian. There was even a lot of this martial law come down hard, the bringing in the National Guard to squelch the, the anti-war movement. It was pretty powerful in America. And in fact, my dad was so ticked off. We ended up moving out of the country. We moved from Santa Cruz from in 1966. I was about eight and a half years old. We were, he was talking about moving the family to the Virgin Islands, United States Virgin Islands. But it was a very fun trip. You know, I got to stay, actually stayed over in Puerto Rico. Oh, I loved it. My, can you imagine an eight and a half year old kid in a, staying in a cabana on the Puerto Rican beach? It was paradise. I mean, all these little lizards running around. I loved to make nooses and catch these little lizards. And it was just paradise. I absolutely loved Puerto Rico. I remember the vendors would walk around selling these little greasy, little like wax bags of potatoes. I think they were potatoes. It might have been something, might have been jicama. I don't know what it was. But, you know, we're looking at 1966, so I don't know what the vendors were selling on the streets of Puerto Rico. But we'd get those things, and I just loved it. You know, my family was together, and that's when TWA existed, Trans World Airlines, and Pan Am, you know, existed, and... I remember flying on these planes and, uh, you know, the scents and the smells of the soaps and all that and the era. But, uh, you know, it was rough for America. But, uh, you know, evil had just had a great victory taking out JFK. So it was a period where evil had to lay low. So there was a sense that, you know, righteous still had a chance back then. You know, the righteous people in this country. But anyhow, my dad's sense that they were racist it was primarily black people living in uh, the virgin united states virgin islands it's you know that's they're endemic they're native there so uh, he he uh, decided to move the family to europe to england specifically and uh, he moved the family to the isle of wight which is the southern end of england and uh, 1966 so i started attending school in england i actually liked that quite a lot too and we were renting a house that was adjacent really just a door or two down from uh, a little village. I mean, it was very village-like. I absolutely loved uh, the Isle of Wight. I loved England. I loved the town of Ride, and you know, the theater was a couple of, you know, pants. It was, he could, the kids could go to the movie theater. I mean, I remember all this stuff, and it was fun. It was really, really neat. I really, I really liked England quite a lot. And uh, but I got in trouble once. I remember. Uh, the time on the uh, playground, you know, if I was in like third grade, I guess, and um, something like that, fourth grade, I forget, you know, that whatever grade you're in at that age, but, you know, you have to wear uniforms. My sisters would go to one segregate the kids, so boys and girls were separated, I think. And you know what, I mean, they might have been in close proximity there in England. I can't remember how it worked. It was a lot more strict. I also lived in Ireland, but. And I hope everybody finds these stories entertaining. But um, I remember marbles were big in England. And it just, it's so funny, you know, to remember. It's so nice to have a brain and a memory, you know. I would hate to have Alzheimer's dementia or something. But playing marbles. And I remember there was this one marble that was highly coveted by the kids. It was all beaten up. It was larger than the normal marble. And, you know, it had history. It had been around. And it was kind of clear and tinted, some color greenish. If I remember correctly, and 
it was just uh, it, one of those things. It was the prize, and you know, if you could ever get possession of it. But you know, the idea was that you had to keep playing, so you, you, nobody takes their winnings and go home. So nobody has any illusions of that. But it was just the thrill of, you know, acquiring it for a, for a moment, you know, to win it. Uh, anyhow, that uh, marbles was big back then, and uh, on the Isle of Wight, in the town of Ride at the school there. But this one time, a kid. Um, I don't know, I got in some squabble over something, you know, maybe a dispute about the marble rules, but I got punched. I don't remember being particularly mad at the kid. I don't know why he whacked me, but he did. And, um, you know, it didn't hurt too much. It didn't break my nose, but um, it was bleeding. And so I went to the yard duty teacher, and I said, uh, this, this kid gave me a bloody nose, I said, you know, and um, the teacher, I got in trouble right away. I was like, whoa, I was taken aback. But you see, the problem is, is that bloody... Is like saying the F word here. So that's why I got in trouble. And then the misunderstanding was straightened out. And, of course, I agreed not to use the word anymore. And I was supposed to say, me nose is bleeding, something like that, you know. This kid gave me a bleeding nose. Me nose is bleeding because this kid smacked me, something like that, maybe. But anyhow, okay, that's enough. That's enough. My dad bought a, um, a fixer-upper sailboat called Solstice. I, th I think he let it keep the original name. Maybe he renamed it. I don't know. But we fixed it up. I lived in this Essex or Sussex or something is where he had the boat. And my mom and my sister spent a lot of time together. and I was a lot off with my dad. I remember going to a pub in England at 10 years old. I guess it was legal to drink. But my dad got me ass-faced drunk and um, at 10 years old, puking my guts out and wasn't into drinking much after that. I don't know that he would have uh, allowed it anyhow if I had any kind of habit forming. But he fixed up little solstice, and um, we did, had a lot of sailing adventures uh, in the Mediterranean. My sisters and my mom would often fly around, but my dad and I, I was kind of forced to, you know, it was just mandated. You don't have much choice at that age to do with your parents. So I did miss some school. Of course, I made up for it. I always did good in school. and I've always been able to learn anything I put my mind to, so it's not an issue. But uh, I've been a lot of places, man. I've been to Spain and Italy and France. I've been all through the canals of France. That's how we got to the Mediterranean. Is um, Entered there, took the boat from England to um, France. And... Um, that's when my mom and sisters got on board. They were with us going through the canals of France. But uh, in the Mediterranean, I think my mom, they were in sisters. They were too scared. and So my dad and I were sailing around a lot. I've been to the island of Ibiza. Ibiza is an island of France. One of, I mean, not France, of Spain. But I remember Porto de Salieres, another port in, in Spain. Beautiful place. God, I mean, I just saw some really cool stuff. And uh, ended up living on Malta. And that was the last stop before my uh, parents came back to the United States. Flew back to Norwich, Connecticut, where my uh, Uncle Bill and Aunt uh, Kay, my dad's sister, in Norwich, Connecticut, had a car waiting for them. We're going back to 1980, 1968. We were living in Ireland at the time. I spent a year there in Ireland. Boy, that's a whole other story there. They they do segregate the um, the pupils by gender, and the girls go to co convents, and the boys go to the public school, which is Catholic, and they have corporal punishment. And uh, my parents didn't know they were doing beating me, something like something out of Oliver Twist, school run by fear and a sadistic teacher. But uh, my dad yanked me out of there and put me in a little Protestant school where the teacher had no money teaching six different grades out of one little church building. But I was able to learn at least. It's hard to learn when you're afraid you're going to have to stand in front of the class and get some fat-ass teacher swatting, swatting your wrist, swatting the palm of your hand because you didn't answer a question fast enough or you answered it wrong. I mean, this guy was sadistic. He chased one kid around the room this one time. Literally, kid crapped in his pants. You could smell it. He was running around. 
total in abject fear of this teacher, terror, terrorized by this sadistic teacher was just, you could feel the adrenaline, you could cut it with a knife, it was the evil spirits in that room. He sent one kid down to the store, I remember this one time, get him a pack of cigarettes, gave him a note, and um, the kid just desperately, frantic and fearful and just ran out of the room because he said he gave him 60 seconds and there's no way the kid could do it. And he said, otherwise I'm going to beat you. And so he held the whole class while this kid ran down to the, to the store to get him his cigarettes. And of course the kid, it took him two or three minutes probably, but you know, the kid was just completely out of breath, freaked out. And the teacher just, you know, chuckled, cackled madly and told him to have a seat.